the Dark Angels are considered amongst the most powerful and secretive of the Loyalist Space Marine chapters. As the first legion of the original 20 created during the first founding, they hold a unique and prestigious position in the records of the Imperium. Although they pledge unwavering loyalty to the Emperor of Mankind, their actions and hidden objectives often appear contradictory to their professed loyalty. It has been noted that the Dark Angels are driven by an overwhelming need to atone for an ancient crime and betrayal committed over 10,000 years ago during the end of the Horus Heresy. Since their inception as the First Legion, the Dark Angels have stood at the forefront of the Space Marines, which has led them to be a proud chapter with traditions and rituals that can be traced back to the earliest days of the Imperium of Man. However, the origins of the Dark Angels remain cloaked in secrecy, as few Imperial records of the chapter's very beginnings still exist, and there are scant mentions in their role during the Emperor's Great Crusade, in particular during the earliest parts of the 31st millennium. It is also important to remember that most records of their deeds during the earliest parts of the Horus Heresy have been expunged from history. Yet a persistent legend tells of a time when the Dark Angels teetered on the brink of heresy and an act of the most grievous betrayal which dishonored the entirety of the First Legion's valor, leaving an indelible stain upon their honor and the honor of all their successor chapters. Such is their shame that from that moment onwards, the Dark Angels and their unforgiven successors have striven for absolution for the sins of millennia past. Now you may ask, what is a terrible secret that the Dark Angels hide? Turns out that during the Horse Heresy, some of their brethren were seduced by the allure of chaos. The renegades ultimately were defeated in a climactic battle that destroyed the Dark Angels Legion's homeworld of Caliban. However, many of the traitorous Dark Angels survived as they were cast throughout space and time by the direct intervention of the Chaos Gods. These survivors are known only to a few of the Dark Angels who are granted knowledge of the existence of the Fallen. In the eyes of the chapter's leaders, there is only one path for redemption, and that is that all the Fallen must be found and either made to repent for their actions and sins or slain for the betrayal. This treachery and betrayal has become the Dark Angel's hidden shame to the point that their secret mission to destroy all of the Fallen is now believed to be their only hope for salvation and redemption. A mission that only the Dark Angels and their successor chapters, along with maybe the Emperor himself, know about, though he is interred in the Golden Throne. Thus, even if he were privy to the chapter's dark history, word would not spread. As they continue their relentless pursuit, the Dark Angels have become a chapter who embodies the tension between honor and shame, loyalty and secrecy, as these aspects define their very existence. It must be noted that within the chapter's structure, there are many levels that individuals may gradually ascend, and with each new level, the knowledge that they are granted increases, if only slightly, as they learn more and more about the truth of the Dark Angel's origins. However, only the highest ranking members, known as the Inner Circle, are privy to the entirety of their shameful secret which they have maintained for over 10,000 years. It is also important to know that the Dark Angels hold more battle honors than any other chapter. Their only equal being their successors. The chapter itself had long fought across the length and breadth of the Imperium's entirety and beyond against every foe that has ever beset mankind. The Dark Angels have held off Orc Wogs, crushed planetary uprisings, and saved entire star systems from incursions of the ruinous powers. Their campaigns have taken them through searing deserts the cold void of space, dense cavernous alien jungles, and even the depths of the wildest of underhives. Yet while chapters such as the Blood Angels and Ultramarines are lauded whenever they fight, the Dark Angels shun laurels and turn their back upon adoration. Even though the chapter has stood side by side with every major arm of the Imperium's military, it has always maintained a distance and aloofness that sets its brethren further apart from the bulk of humanity and even from other space marines. 
Marines, when the Dark Angels join a larger force to execute a great war or an imperial crusade, they do so according to their own unfathomable goals. When the Dark Angels force is committed to such a conflict, it will remain aloof. Its officers keep their own counsel on matters of tactics and strategy, preferring to maintain their own lines of communication separate from the rest of the Imperium and even their own supply sources. This includes when dealing with battle brothers of other Astartes chapters. The Dark Angels will often remain sullen and quiet at the Space Marines' command councils and tactical briefings, though this does not suggest that they are any less effective or active on the battlefield. When the Dark Angels undertake operations alongside other chapters, it is quite common for them to do so with others amongst the so-called Unforgiven, successor chapters of the original Dark Angels, more so than it would be to join chapters such as the Blood Angels or the Imperial Fists. The successors of the First Legion seem to have maintained an especially close relationship with their progenitors, especially with their own members of the Inner Circle. This complex history and hierarchy has been informed by the Dark Angels' secretive nature as they remain a chapter apart, driven by their shame, in a relentless quest for redemption, much like a monastic order of old, as they continue their eternal vigil. One of the things that sets the Dark Angels apart from most other chapters is a unique command network which directly ties the Dark Angels with all the Unforgiven chapters, designed so they can utilize the bulk of what amounts to a pseudo-legion to great effect. There is no presumption that the leaders of the Dark Angels have any interest in enforcing their superiority over those of the other Unforgiven chapters. Rather, the leaders work together rather closely and, if needed, elect one of their members as a nominal commander for the duration of any campaign once this communication network establishes the need. In one matter, however, the officers of the Dark Angels do hold superiority over those of the Unforgiven chapters. This is in the Hunt of the the fallen. When hunting those turncoat dark angels who escaped the fall of Caliban, the Unforgiven operate under the auspice of the highest ranked of the inner circle, and the very highest of these is the Supreme Grand Master himself, Chapter Master of the Dark Angels. Currently, it's Azrael. More recently, with the return of their Primarch, it would be the Lion himself. Through the machinations of the Unforgiven's inner circle, its members are entirely vigilant and remain in a never-resting, never-ending hunt for the Fallen. Even though the knowledge is withheld from the majority of their brethren, they will still hunt the fallen when commanded. The result of post-battle debriefings with those who should not know of the fallen's identity, even within the chapter, is post-battle, psi-induced stress purges, and information being fed back directly to the inner circle's upper echelons, as any sign of the Fallen's presence is analyzed and scrutinized to an extreme degree. In addition, the Dark Angel's chaplains are permanently attached to a company, allowing them to hear confessions of their battle brothers and keep a close watch for any signs of the Fallen. When such traces are discovered, the inner circle moves without hesitation, completely redeploying the unforgiven and abandoning anything and anywhere they may be, in order to task them with retaking their target. In most cases, it is the Ravenwing that locates the Fallen's activity, and it is the Deathwing that delivers the killing blow. However, on occasion, entire Dark Angel strike forces have been recalled and relocated from campaigns, and committed to engage an enemy that only the highest ranking officials have any knowledge of. While a great deal of the Unforgiven's efforts and resources are committed to the hunt of the Fallen, the majority of their brethren have no knowledge on the matter. Rather, the Dark Angels and their successors are constantly warned against the words of heretics, and their chapter dogma exalts the virtues of the eternal hunt of those who forswear the most powerful of oaths. The company's chaplains serve greatly in this function, as their sermons tell of legendary figures betrayed by their own, often having fought in battles far from their homes. Numerous such tales exist, and each is revealed as a part of a slow and deliberate pattern 
in order to have the brothers contemplate on their place in the chapter. But it is only upon the battle brother's ascension to the inner circle that he is told anything approaching the truth, even though each of these tales is drawn from said truth. And even then, there are some secrets that are only known at the very highest of tiers. In particular, there is a great focus on how much the shame of the Dark Angels, a battle brother may be allowed to know, is completely dependent upon his station within the chapter, and how far he has gone to prove himself to the agents of the inner circle. A battle brother may have fought the fallen unwittingly, believing his foe is yet another vile traitor who is worthy only of death. Perhaps their sergeant knew more, or the lieutenant, or even the captain. Certainly his company master did, but he himself will never know until he is inducted into the inner circle. Conversely, there are some higher ranked brothers who despite exemplary service are never inducted into the inner circle. Perhaps the chaplains harbor some small amount of doubt or even have reason to believe the individual would not be able to bear the terrible truth of what occurred during the end of the Horus heresy. Such Astartes, despite an exemplary record, would be unlikely to progress much further, for at the highest levels of authority, the chapter is ever engaged upon the hunt for the fallen. Now on to the origins of the Dark Angels. While their history is shrouded in mystery, they stand as the Emperor's first Space Marine Legion, forged in the Crucible of War during the infancy of the Imperium and having operated within the earliest days of the Great Crusade. They stand as the prototype for what would become the Legion's Astartes, wielding some of the most advanced archaeotech possible and plasma weapons allowed them to be set apart from other formidable warriors. Known simply as the Angels of Death or the Sixth Host back then, they were the vanguard of the Emperor's conquests, dominating the final days of the Unification Wars with unparalleled prowess. In this era, the First Legion, as they would later be known, rose to unprecedented power and favor under the Emperor's ever watchful gaze. However, their supremacy would be challenged by brutal conflicts during the Great Crusade, particularly the devastating Randang Xenocides, which greatly depleted their ranks and tested their resolve like never before. Yet it was during these trials that the Dark Angels found their renewal as they were reunited with the Primarch Lionel Johnson and incorporated fresh blood from his homeworld of Caliban into their legion. Caliban, a death world teeming with martial traditions and fierce warrior orders, proved fertile grounds for the legion's regeneration. Its harsh environments and warrior ethos helped shape the Dark Angels into an even more formidable set of warriors as they embraced their destinies as killers in the service of the Imperium. Their battles, often against unspeakable horrors lurking in the void, remained largely unrecorded. Their sacrifices, known only to those who bore witness to their valiant deeds. As it seems, the true origins of the Dark Angels and many of their practices will forever remain veiled in secrecy. However, we do assuredly know that they were the prototype that the Emperor conceived for the Space Marine Legions, and their creation laid the groundwork for the use of Primarch DNA in order to create and implant the traits necessary in the creation of these transhuman warriors and in the process of their creation, a few stable protostartes were made. These initial creations were referred to as the primordial strain and formed the foundation for the first legion, laying the groundwork for the subsequent space marines. And despite the secrecy surrounding their origins, the dark angels stand as a testament to the Emperor's grand design and his enduring legacy, as theirs is a history etched in blood and sacrifice, a saga of duty and honor that continues to shape the very fate of humanity and the galaxy beyond. The inception itself of the Dark Angels occurred through the drawing in of many recruits from the nomadic youth of conquered adversaries on Terra. And unlike their counterparts in other legions, the Dark Angels would bear no singular genetic imprint, as their ranks essentially reflected a mosaic of the diverse cultural backgrounds that still remained on Terra. These early recruits would be handpicked from the finest available stock and brought 
to the Emperor, from the resilient infantry of Albia to the adept cavalry warriors of the Anatolic Steppes, each infusion of aspirants enriched the legion with a kaleidoscope of combat experiences. The first legion thus became a crucible for the brutal wisdom and tactics developed from old knight as they were distilled into a new arsenal of warfare for the emperor. The new unity in those early years created by the birth of the first proto-warriors of the first legion led them to be encouraged to leave their old names behind and embrace a new form of unity which led to the adoption of names from ancient legends. The first roles of honor given to these proto-astartes were names like Gilgamesh, Heracles, Trekkon, Hengsit. This practice combined with a grim aspect granted by their gene seed quickly earned them a reputation as a band of gods, all cast from a singular potent mold. These would be the uncrowned princes. Initially, these warriors fought in small groups within the emperor's hosts, mastering both their original skills and the new techniques taught by the imperial laboratories of the biotechnical division. They became known as the uncrowned princes or simply the crown after a certain amount of time a title that inspired unity and no uncertain lack of arrogance, and it reflected their place amongst the emperor's chosen, which caused them to gain ranks of leadership within their brotherhood of the legions Astartes. Amidst the amalgamation of the cultures from the proto-warriors that created the Dark Angels Legion were a myriad of ancestral identities which melded into what would be the Emperor's finest fighting force. Fighting as the elite vanguard of the Emperor's armies, these warriors, led by the uncrowned princes, embodied all the aspects that the Emperor had found missing within the Thunder Warriors. It was within the Legion's earliest moments that the genesis of the hosts, which were quintessential for the formation of the First Legion, came to be laying the groundwork for what would later become the hexagrammation wings under their primarch, Lionel Johnson. These hosts were informal groups within the early companies which each adapted particular battle doctrines from their diverse origins in order to create cohesive cadres suitable for the Emperor's transhuman armies. Unlike traditional military structures, these hosts were not bound by company or command and existed throughout the Legion, offering their expertise as needed. In the formative years of the First Legion, the number of hosts exceeded those later formed under the Hexagrammation, and historical records from the Unification Wars indicate the existence of up to 18 distinct formations, each identified by unique heraldry. These hosts were pivotal in shaping the Legion's early tactical versatility. One notable engagement within the Third Siege of Antioch in 603 M30 saw the deployment of nine distinct hosts from across separate companies. Despite numbering fewer than 30 warriors each, these hosts demonstrated considerable tactical overlap and versatility in their methods of combat which were instrumental in breaching the walls of this ancient enclave. The early hosts would go on to exemplify the resilience of the First Legion, showcasing a blend of diverse martial traditions, flexibility, and the collective wisdom of warriors who had already gained an incredible amount of experience, which were key to the Emperor's campaigns, as these hosts would lay a robust foundation for the later Dark Angels and their successor chapters, as their legacy would endure as the Legion evolved under the guidance of Lionel Johnson into a highly specialized and formidable force within the Imperium. Over time, the chaotic proliferation of hosts within the First Legion would be gradually consolidated into smaller and more focused specialized groups. In those formative years, with their brother legions still in their nascent stages, the first legion served as a testing ground for various tactics and doctrines that would later become the Principa Belisca, which would be implemented within the other legions. As the legion grew significantly larger in order to engage in small-scale combat actions more fluidly, some more specialized hosts became obsolete. 
and rendered unnecessary by the warriors who had become particularly adept in those styles of warfare. Others were eradicated by the brutal nature of the 30th millennium and the warfare encountered by those within, in particular due to the inadequacies of the methods employed. Far from weakening the legion, this process of bloody evolution left it stronger and caused the legion to become a refined weapon honed to perfection by the battles fought on Terra. This period of relentless combat also created a deep bond amongst the disparate warriors of the early legion. Their sense of superiority and distinction was instilled by the emperor's servants who had trained them and reinforced by the awe they inspired within those who they fought alongside. Eventually it would come time for the fall of the thunder warriors, as the first legion like all legions of Astartes was intended to replace the Thunder Warriors due to the proto Astartes known as the Thunder Warriors being an unstable experiment designed for the brutal exigencies of the Unification Wars, meaning the Thunder Warriors were tools needed for their time, rather unrefined and savage weapons capable of matching the grim tyrants and the debauched potents that had inherited old earth during the age of strife. Despite their greater physical power, the thunder warriors were a rough breed, individually perhaps more powerful than their new transhuman kin, however due to how they were created, they were unable to quell their fury and work in any form of unison. They were in essence a mob, a storm of fury and blades designed to overwhelm their foes through sheer ferocity. In stark contrast, the legions of Astartes were a true army, their unity and discipline enabling them to withstand any onslaught. This crucial difference marked an evolutionary leap from the brutal force of the Thunder Warriors to the sophisticated, coordinated might of the Space Marine Legions. The transition from Thunder Warrior to Astartes signified a pivotal moment in the Emperor's grand design. It was a shift from raw chaotic power necessary to subjugate the war-torn Terra as quickly as possible to the disciplined strategic force required to expand and hold the burgeoning Imperium. And the first legion as the first and prototype bore the brunt of this transition embodying the lessons learned and the refinements made in the crucible of war which would eventually lead to the disappearance of the Thunder Warriors from the annals and records of imperial history. Their end remains mostly shrouded in countless tales and theories, with some even believing there are still yet the remnants of the Thunder Warriors amongst the Imperium. There are many such tales. One more well-known example originates from the nomadic tribes dwelling near Mount Ararat who recorded an ominous army clad in grey awaiting the return of the wary thunder warriors. According to the legend, rather than honoring their valiant predecessors, these warriors unleashed their thunderous follies of death upon the exhausted thunder warriors as they would go on to eliminate them. While this greatly diverges from the heroic narratives propagated by remembrancers, this grim tale aligns with the ruthless nature of the Emperor's grand design. However, though lacking in evidence, the anecdotal accounts from years later during the Great Crusade offers intriguing insights, including reports indicating the relentless pursuit of renegade thunder warriors by the fleets of the First Legion, who had diverged from their course to annihilate these remnants. This singular obsession hinted at a deeper, more personal motive, perhaps driven by a sense of shame or duty to rectify past failures. Another ancient source suggests a darker turn, asserting that the Thunder Warriors, resentful of their shortened lifespan and perceived betrayal by the Emperor due to the creation of the Adeptus Astartes, turned against their creator in a desperate bid for vengeance, and in response to this, a cadre of custodians led by Constantine Valdor and aided by swarms of prototype Astartes from the First Legion were sent to ruthlessly quell this rebellion. 
However, which story is true is largely shrouded by the First Legion's secrets, coupled with the Imperial Decree which obscures many of their early campaigns, rendering the truth of their involvement with the end of the Thunder Warriors as an elusive enigma. And so began the dawn of the Legion's Astartes, heralded as a new era in the Emperor's grand design. Amongst them, the First Legion was the one who would stand as the vanguard, a force of unmatched power and potential. With 10,000 transhuman warriors, they had eclipsed their nascent brethren, who stood in mere hundreds in number. It was at Samkrand on Terra, amidst the final echoes of the Unification Wars, that the First Legion emerged en masse, led by the Emperor himself. Here, the blood-soaked fields of Samarakt was where the Legions of Astartes faced their official inaugural trial as an army. Against them stood the formidable Ugudu Hul, 2,000 gene-forced warriors whose venomous blood and superhuman strength made them the scourge of the Upper Asiatic Basin. In the crucible of battle, the First Legion proved their mettle, performing even better than the Thunder Warriors. For ten grueling hours, the armies clashed, and echoes reverberated against the desolate landscape, until Samarkand lay in ruins, leading to the great king of Akend to be defeated. Hector Thrain, the newly appointed Grand Master of the Legion, emerged as the architect of this victory, his triumph immortalized as he was bestowed with the title of Sinestra of the Emperor, the left hand of Terra's warlord. In the aftermath, the Emperor decreed the erasure of the harrowing conflict from records, yet the legend of the First Legion's first triumph endures. Their valorous stand at Samarkand would hasten the recruitment and training of the new legions, as their prowess in combat had been validated in this crucible of war. And the first legion emerged from the inferno of battle, their reputation cast in the shadow of legends, as a testament to their master's grand design. As time would go on, the first legion's victories were noted but shrouded in secrecy and whispered in dread. From the desolate fortress 31 in the Thulin Wastes to the fiery crucible known as Karakon on Sendra's Cairo volcanic mountains. The first legion waged an unending war against the most abominable forces who stood against unity. Their singular objective, annihilate all those who stood before the emperor's path. Their battles veiled in horror as they confronted Xenos nightmares and psychic aberrations that defied comprehension. Such was the terror of their adversaries that records of these conflicts are intentionally obscured and relegated to mere echoes in the histories of the Imperium. Endowed with unprecedented access to the Imperial Palace's forbidden armories, the First Legion would be renowned for wielding mankind's darkest weaponry with impunity. Under Grand Master Hector Thrain, cities like Kundur and Malay were razed to ash, their ruins a testament to the Legion's merciless resolve. Gene phage mutations purged from Euclidus and Saturn's moon of the vile Canave infestation, the first left barren landscapes as monuments to their grim victories. Their reputation seemed to precede them, as the first earned the morbid reverence of humanity's ranks. They were not celebrated heroes, but feared harbingers of death, rumored to even be death's own hand in the mortal realm. As superstition swelled around them, due to soldiers whispering and bearing charms along with wards near them, despite the ideals of the imperial truth, the first legion was viewed not as saviors or even mortals of any form, but as avatars of destruction brought into the mortal realm in order to serve the emperor. In the shadow of their presence, fear and awe mingled, for where the first legion tread, only death would follow as a silent witness to their inexorable march towards victory. 
the first legion's march was not without an eerie aura, one which would seem to remain even 10,000 years later, as those who have fought alongside them often met a grisly fate, their ranks torn asunder by the merciless adversaries that the legion sought to vanquish. Some units met untimely ends, consumed by the very horrors they were meant to conquer, while others simply vanished without a trace. Yet the first legion remained, as rumors would only be silenced once the first legion themselves decided to speak up, ensuring that no whisper of foes reached the ears of those left behind. In response to their grim reputation, the warriors of the first would embrace the macabre image, donning the guise of death itself. By adorning their armor with somber symbols of mortality, added to this there was the self-imposed isolation becoming tantamount to a badge of honor for the legionaries, a solemn sacrifice they viewed to shield their comrades from the unspeakable horrors they faced on the battlefield. Yet to outsiders, particularly the brethren from other legions, this aloofness seemed more akin to prideful arrogance. However, the first legion was undeterred by such perceptions, as the masters of the first legion remained steadfast in their ways. The legion itself cloaked in a shroud of dark rumors as they waged war on the battlefield, while other legions reveled in the glory of triumph and conquest, the first operated in veritable shadows, entrusted with the emperor's most dire and clandestine missions. They were the emperor's left hand, wielding their grim aspect with ruthless efficiency, all hidden beneath the glittering facade of the imperial army's grandeur. As the sun rose on the era of the great crusade, the first legion stood as a vanguard of the Emperor's ambitions, and in part they were entrusted with the solemn duty that would set them apart from the rest, while the younger legions were prepared to embark on the monumental task of galactic conquest, the first would embark on the solitary watch over the soul system, guarding them against the lurking threats that sought to infiltrate the Emperor's burgeoning realm. For nearly a decade, the First Legion patrolled the dark expanse of space just beyond the reaches of the Soul System, scouring the distant outposts and icy moons of the outer system for any signs of danger. They were the Emperor's Angels of Death, a title officially bestowed upon them exclusively, symbolizing their vigil in the void. Amidst the desolate depths of space, the Legion's specialized units, known as Orders, would emerge in more prominent a fashion, each one now being specifically designed for a particular aspect of warfare, much more tailored to the challenges of the outer reaches of the Soul System than they would have been during their original inception. These warriors had honed their skills throughout countless battles against the unknown and now were experts, with their expertise encoded into the very fabric of their legion. As both traditions and rituals, through sacrifice and perseverance, they would uncover the weaknesses in their adversaries, tactically ensuring that they would be best exploited in order to guarantee victory in the face of the most daunting of challenges. Upon their return from the desolate reaches of space, their patrol now ended, the first legion emerged transformed. Their once gray armor was now cloaked in a profound and ominous black. Their homecoming was devoid of pomp or circumstance, and it was marked only by the silent acknowledgement of the emperor himself, who recognized their readiness to confront the myriad of tasks lurking across a galaxy. As the legionaries assembled amidst the bustling shipyards of Saturn, their fleets stood as a testament to the valor and the glory of their heritage. Amongst the sleet Saturnine vessels and ancient Martian relics, the first legion boasted a tithe of Terran ships, relics from a bygone era. These majestic vessels included formidable Gloriana-class battleships and the heavily armored Promethean-class cruisers, which surpassed modern designs in both power and prestige. While other legions received only a scant view of these vessels, the first legion was granted an entire fleet as a testament to 
to their unwavering loyalty and dedication to the Emperor's cause, a rather long-running theme amongst the Dark Angels. With these ancient relics at their command, the First Legion stood poised to lead the charge against the looming threats that haunted humanity's survival. The bestowal of the ancient ships upon the First Legion marked not only a mere accolade for deeds past, but a strategic necessity for the trials that would be set upon them. As the Great Crusade ventured beyond the realms of Old Knight's charts, they would encounter horrors that dwarfed even the greatest conflicts of Terra. The Legion now found themselves in dire need of formidable weaponry, and unlike their brethren, the First Legion was allowed to wield said forbidden arms of destruction with grim efficiency. Gene Phage and Rad Waves, relics of a forgotten age, became their tools of choice, deployed in order to eradicate all abominations deemed too monstrous for conventional warfare. They were now the Emperor's wrath incarnate. Amongst their many conquests, whispers persisted of Belthagene IV, a world ensnared by the horrors of a cosmic contagion, as the third chapter of the First Legion, forged from hosts of stone and iron, embarked on a harrowing campaign against the fortress forged from the very mountains of the world's most formidable peaks, which harbored malevolent entities of hyperacidic slime. These abominations were a nucleus of infestation which had devoured worlds, reducing millions to mere substance for their insatiable appetites. Pictorial remnants hint at the desolation of the Oslin Cluster, where the 19th Expeditionary Fleet confronted a sentient planet killer, a relic of a forgotten empire unleashed upon the unsuspecting realms which now would belong to the God Emperor. Grandmaster Hector Thrain's seal upon the records, in the essence, shrouded any details other than the pictorial remnants of this confrontation. Such grim battles were amongst countless others, which showed the wars waged in shadows by the First Legion, as they stood paragon in eradicating all existential threats with ruthless efficiency. Yet their various deeds would remain uncelebrated, as their campaigns would constantly be expunged from records, in order to safeguard the fragile sanity of those unacquainted with the unrelenting malice of the Void. To outsiders, these early exploits of the First may appear modest compared to their brethren, however behind the veil of secrecy lie the exemplars of grandeur. Time and time again, the First Legion would prove themselves as the most suitable to be the Imperium's vanguard during the Great Crusade, as they stood as bastions of Imperial supremacy, boasting unrivaled numbers, vast armadas, and access to weapons of unparalleled potency, even eclipsing those of their brethren like the Luna Wolves and the Space Wolves, who had already been reunited with their Primarchs. At the helm of these juggernauts stood the Grandmaster of the First Legion, a figure of immense authority within the Imperial Court, whose word was only second to legends such as Malkador the Sigilite and Horus Lupacal. Yet, despite their covert victories, the First Legion would command universal respect and acknowledgement as the preeminent fighting forces for humanity amongst its transhuman warriors. They were the very embodiment of the Emperor's desired martial might. Yet like the shifting sands of time, their supremacy proved transient, as they too were vulnerable to the corrosive forces of pride and arrogance. In their quest for worthy adversaries, the First Legion would become ensnared by their own hubris, disregarding lesser threats as unworthy of their attention. This would become a fatal flaw, born of overconfidence, which would sow the seeds of the Legion's eventual downfall. As with each adversary they vanquished, they would fortify themselves in an armor of arrogance, unyielding, convinced that they were the pinnacle of martial prowess and of the glory and perfection of the hexagrammation, which was once a fluid repository of knowledge and strategic competency, led to stagnation as complacency 
and overconfidence took root. Due to this, recruitment, which was once a steady stream flowing from distant worlds, would dwindle to a mere trickle. As the Legion's insular enclaves on Terra and selected planets honored their traditions of casting aside anyone who was viewed as even slightly inferior. This led to battles which were once opportunities for growth and adaptation becoming validations of entrenched dogma, and with victories becoming celebrated as proof of their inherent superiority and defeats being dismissed as the failings of lesser beings. As the Great Crusade continued to unfurl, the once open and explorative demeanor of the First Legion morphed into a shroud of constant secrecy and strict, if not rigid, adherence to tradition. Those who were once initially hailed as mentors to their brethren now harbored a growing resentment towards those who they had once guided, while other legions garnered acclaim for seemingly effortless conquests, the first saw their own hard-won victories overshadowed by the laurels of others. Amidst this shifting landscape of power, rivals would emerge. The Ultramarines, led by their Primarch, the illustrious Rabut Giamon, boasted greater numbers, while the Imperial Fists under Rogal Dorn wielded formidable relics such as the Phalanx, for a legion steeped in a sense of authority, supremacy, and superiority, finding themselves merely amongst equals struck a devastating blow to their pride. Yet it was the fateful campaign at Canis Balor that delivered the final blow to the faltering confidence of the nigh-invincible first. In a seemingly inconsequential star system, the first faced an adversary whose very existence had eluded the records of their orders. Despite their confidence, their relics, and their reliance on tested strategies, these Xenos of Canis Balor unleashed a ferocity and technological prowess that defied all rational explanation. The first, being unaccustomed to setbacks, suffered unbelievably heavy losses, as their pride was now shattered in the wake of the ignominy of defeat. Defeat, an adversary once presumed conquered by the first, emerged anew, shattering their veneer of invincibility which had cloaked the first legion for so long. Emboldened by their pride, they continued to launch assault upon assault against the relentless Xenos of Canis Balor. Each was met with fierce resistance, and the rate of mounting casualties was out of control. Grandmaster Hector Thrain, once revered for his flawless leadership, found himself ensnared in a web of hubris, ignoring counsel, all the while being driven by the beliefs in his warrior's unmatched prowess, led Thane to lead a final desperate charge, and though their blades cleaved through the enemy's ranks, their valor was eclipsed by the overwhelming number of foes they now faced. As defeat loomed large, Thrain would make the ultimate sacrifice, remaining behind in order to ensure the retrieval of vital assets. This was a noble act, born out of the belated realization of his own failure. In the aftermath, Canis Valor did lay desolate, its surface scorched by nuclonic fire Instead of a victorious sentiment, it was a testament to the First Legion's unchecked pride, and what a price they had to pay. As the records of the alien menace were quickly sealed, and their memory consigned to obscurity, save for the clandestine archives of the Order of the Broken Claws, the loss of this battle and their legendary leader ignited a maelstrom of discontent within the Legion, and amidst the ashes of defeat, power struggles began to occur within the once mighty Dark Angels. This threatened to erode the foundation of its supremacy in a way nothing else had. Amidst the hollowed halls of Gramer, the ancestral stronghold of the First, a tempest began to brew within the Council of Masters. This was due to the loss of their faithful leader, leading them to a realization of their own blindness. As the selection for a new Grand Master became the epicenter of this internal conflict, with each host vying for supremacy and unwilling to concede to another. As the Legion's conquests continued to falter and stagnation loomed, it would only be the intervention of Malkador the Sigilite which would set things straight, as he would shatter this impasse. With words etched into the chamber's lentil, Malkador delivered 
a clarion call for unity, reminding the Council that strength lay not in individual prowess, but in their collective resolve. He decreed that a fortress upheld by many stands tall. Alone it crumbles, yet without a master its strength is not. In the wake of Malkador's intervention, the First Legion stood poised to reclaim its tattered mantle of glory and greatness. With its resolve alit anew, the First Legion began to heal. In a monumentous decision that resounded for eons, Malkador's words were taken to heart, as Uran Vendring, a battle-hardened captain, would emerge as a chosen to become the Legion's master, and he would be entrusted with the Herculean task of restoring the fractured Legion to glory. And he would embark into this role with a fervor unlike any other, recognizing the imperative of the First's full participation in the Emperor's Great Crusade. In order to herald this new chapter in the Legion's history, a select group of Remembrancers were granted access to witness the Legion's resurgence under its new leadership. However, destiny would have one final twist in store. Just as the Legion stood on the precipice of renewal, news arrived of a formidable adversary lurking in the fringes of the Great Crusade, the powerful Rangdang, a name that had been whispered across the galaxy with the utmost trepidation, as the First Legion prepared its forces anew in order to face this great threat. The eyes of the Imperium quickly turned to the First, as they would go on to confront this deadly foe upon the northern rim of the galaxy, as the 105th Pioneer Company of the 5th Legion stumbled upon the menacing presence of the Rangdang. It was noted that they were, as of yet, just confined to a singular star system. Even though their advanced technology was formidable, they posed one of the greatest threats to the Imperium's expansion. Responding to this, the newly appointed Grand Master marshaled a vast armada numbering in the hundreds of ships as they descended upon Advux Morse, the heart of the Rangdang, and their power base. There they confronted a horrifying spectacle, a colossal artificial war moon erected through the sacrifice of countless lives across the galaxy. In the ensuring clash, the planet bore witness to an apocalypse. The once thriving system had been reduced to desolation, its six worlds transformed into lifeless wastelands. The Rangdan Armada, once formidable, lay shattered amidst the debris of space, their slave armies annihilated without mercy. Despite the victory, the cost was staggering. Four solar months of relentless combat had claimed the lives of 5,000 warriors from the First Legion. Yet, as a banner of the Imperium fluttered over the ruins of the Rangdang War Moon, the galaxy would be reminded of the might of the First Legion, who stood as a bulwark against the ever encroaching darkness. To be more specific, the numbers comprising the First in this conflict was a staggering 50,000 legionaries, with an additional 100,000 support troops drawn from Imperial Army regiments, yet so fierce were their enemies that they struggled to complete the mission. Yet the first was once again successful, as always. With this Imperial victory, the remaining Xenos in the sector scattered, seeking refuge within their dwindling fortresses as the last bastions of their defense crumbled. Yet this retreat was in vain, for the Imperium had tightened its grip within the region and thus with each passing day, their presence within the system dwindled until finally it was fully cleansed of their taint. In the aftermath of their triumph, the Grand Master of the First Legion hungered for further accolades and greater victories to adorn his legion's banners. Amidst the whispers of victory and glory, it was the First Legion who would embark most boldly on the relentless pursuit of conquest, and each victory was sought with an increasing fervor that bordered on the reckless. Even as their laurels grew, the distant eyes of Terra's Divisio Militaris watched with an air of expectation, deeming the Legion's exploits as nothing beyond the ordinary. Undeterred by the shadow of this grand expectation, the Grand Master of the First set his sights on the formidable bastion of Carcassan, a fortress that had defied the legendary prowess of Reboot Giamon and his elite Ultramarines for nearly a solar month. The Lord of Ultramar 
known for his patience and strategic acumen, had laid meticulous plans to besiege this legendary fortress, preferring a more methodical approach in order to avoid casualties. Yet when the first arrived on scene, their ambitions were undaunted by the caution or counsel set about by Rabut Giamon. Instead of aligning with his prudent strategies, they saw an opportunity to test their mettle against the renowned Primarch himself. Forming a resolute front before the towering gates of the fortress, the warriors of the First Legion charged forward, driven by a hunger to humble a legend. As the sun dipped below the horizon, the battlefield would be cast in an eerie light, as the initial assault was met with a thunderous barrage of rampart cannons, claiming hundreds of lives instantly. Yet undeterred by the ferocity of the defenders, the black armored first pressed on, their determination unyielding, sacrificing themselves in order to breach the formidable gates, in a furious manner reminiscent of the world eaters. Meanwhile, the ultramarines, under the prudent leadership of Rabut Giamon, advanced cautiously and methodically, securing objectives with minimal loss. However, the vanguard of the first legion surged ahead their sights set on the central plaza, which was the veritable heart of the citadel. Yet as victory seemed within their grasp, treachery lurked within the shadows, and in a desperate bid in order to thwart invaders, the planet's overlords unleashed a hidden atomic mine beneath the keep, and in a blinding flash of light which deafened all those near, the second grandmaster of the first legion along with his loyal cadre from the host of death were all swallowed by the earth. Their triumph turned into a tragedy, and amidst the smoldering ruins and the fallen heroes of the Legion, victory would stand bittersweet. This was a price paid in blood and valor, which only seemed to amplify the triumph they had wrestled from the jaws of defeat. Yet, as the dust settled and the echoes of battle faded, the Lord of Ultramar, stoic and unyielding, offered no solace for the victorious warriors. His gaze, cold like steel, pierced through the ranks of the battered legion, his words cutting deeper than any sword. Vain glory is a poor strategist, he would go on to say, for he renders triumph a bitter trophy and an empty prize. Today you have proven your strength, but not your wisdom. Within those solemn words lay a profound lesson, a reminder the victory was not measured on conquest alone, but in the wisdom to discern when to wield a sword and when to sheathe it. The legion would go on to nurse their wounds once again, as they mourned their fallen. This led them to stand on the crossroads, as their path forward was uncertain. In the aftermath, of the Grandmaster's passing, a chilling specter emerged once again, as the warriors of the First Legion became embittered, viewing the planet as a reminder of their fractured brotherhood with the Ultramarines, since they were no longer even viewed as revered mentors, but relegated to equals, if not lessers, as many within the Legion viewed the words of Giamon as an insult of the harshest order. However, despite all this, the First Legion would continue to march forward, driven by the desire to reclaim their honor once again, and prove their valor in the face of adversity. Once again, the Council Masters would seize control of the mighty First Legion, dispersing its forces in the vast expanse of the cosmos, in a pursuit for vindication through the crucible of conflict. Each segment within the Legion would be driven by an unrelenting desire to prove their mettle not just against themselves, but against all other Space Marine Legions, heedless of the sacrifices demanded by this relentless pursuit. Eventually, in a daring raid cloaked in darkness, the ninth and fourth segments of the Legion stormed the citadels of Melank, and they were even able to wrestle control away from Faraal in a night of relentless carnage. Yet despite achieving victory once again, the cost was staggering as a tenth of their own was sacrificed in this relentless pursuit of triumph. Yet they were spurred on by the looming threat of the Luna Wolves elsewhere within this cluster. Meanwhile, amidst the vast deserts of Varsigon, a valiant force comprised of a thousand initiates from the hosts of iron faced off against a horde of savage orcoid hulks, which outnumbered them threefold. Yet despite the odds being stacked against them, these warriors of the first fought with unyielding 
determination, and eventually claimed victory once more at a harrowing cost. Yet despite the relentless campaigns and all the blood spilled in the name of honor, the First Legion found themselves no closer to reclaiming their illustrious glory, as a path towards redemption was still fraught with ever-mounting challenges and sacrifices. But as the galaxy continued to unfold within the wake of these conflicts, the Legion's Astartes would each evolve into a distinct force, honing their tactics, strategies, and even identities in the crucible of this galactic conflict. Principles laid down by the Dark Angels on Terra became less and less prevalent. It would be during this era that in the heart of Ultramar, its lord, Reboot Giamon, and the Ultramarines would craft a thesis on war going forward, which would in essence replace in almost totality the thesis and stratagems originating from the First Legion's early existence. But this was no slight, it was a testament to the ceaseless quest for improvement which sight of had been lost by the First Legion. The glorious era of the First Legion's supremacy seemed to have its final death nail placed, as they had once been a bastion of the burgeoning Imperium who had now faded into all but obscurity, their veiled secrecy being more of a detriment than a boon, as their glorious past now existed only in the memories of elder warriors and the clandestine records of the Imperial Archives. It was a bitter irony that their most illustrious achievements remained entwined with their honor and held captive by the shadows of forgotten battles. Yet as the Great Crusade surged forward due to the Emperor's relentless campaigns to unite the galaxy, the First Legion found themselves at a pivotal juncture in their saga. As their sister legions flourished and grew in strength, it seems the Angels of Death would endure another fate. Their power dissipated in sacrificial endeavors and harrowing campaigns as their limits were tested. These wars extracted a heavy toll and continued to deplete the ranks and war machines beyond prudence. However, this would also temper the legionaries into formidable warriors as they would become stoic harbingers of death in the eyes of their allies, ever seeking worthy adversaries to test their mettle against. Warriors who refuse to retreat even in the face of certain doom, as leadership would now remain divided amongst the council masters. Such a path seemed destined to lead the Legion to their downfall. Their pride had become a double-edged sword. Yet once more, fate seemed to intervene when the scouting fleet of the White Scars under Jagged Eye Khan's command stumbled across a world shrouded in mystery. This was Caliban, and amidst the shadowed forests of Caliban, the Emperor would unveil the First Legion's salvation, Lionel Johnson.